This is the day the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. If you have a Bible, turn to Psalms, Psalm 90, Psalm 90. I love the Psalms, and uh, they really minister to you. They're so practical, so helpful. Psalm 90. Uh, we'll read one verse, make some comments, and then read the rest and get into the message today. It's kind of like a, an opening to get our minds kind of pointed in the right direction. Um, every word of God is pure, and you can glean so much from every scripture. Uh, when you start reading context, you get a little more. When you start reading whole books, you get a little more. And when you read the whole Bible, you get a little more. It's, it's good to have the word in your heart. Psalm 90, look with me at verse 9. The Bible says the latter part, we spend our years as a tale that is told. As a tale that is told. We're all writing the story of our lives. Um, it might not be in a book somewhere down here, but it is in a book somewhere. And the Bible talks about that. The psalmist said, my tongue is the pen of a ready writer. Uh, he saw things and he recorded them or wanted to. Uh, of course, a lot of things we talk about, those words are in eternity. Amen? Think of that. That's pretty powerful. Um, if I was writing the story of my life, and I've contemplated that, I mean, obviously you can't put everything in there, but I wanted to bring some things out, but I would probably rip out some chapters. I would probably not want to write about some chapters in my life. Uh, I might want to, like to this point in my life, rewrite some of the chapters. Um, they came to Pilate. Pilate put that uh, superscription over the Lord when he was crucified. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. And they came and they said, don't put that up there. Say, he said he was the King of the Jews. Big difference in the meaning. And Pilate said, what I have written, I have written. And what God has written, God has written. Amen? And uh, that's the same with us. The story that we've told from our lives, it is there. But I was thinking about this uh, last night and this morning, there are some biographies, autobiographies that are written and you read the stories of these people and they're really bad. You know, they're away from God, they're just bad stories. But then you see in the last chapter the story of the grace of God. And sometimes you had to read the bad to see how good the grace of God is. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And God comes along and he finishes the book, amen? And even, even if we were like the thief on the cross and at the very end we say, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom, he still now has eternity to be with the Lord. What a story, what a story. They're just a blessing to think about. Um, there was a preacher and an actor. Uh, they were talking one time and the actor finally said to the preacher, he said, you say the truth, but you say it like it's fiction. And uh, he said, we say fiction, but we say it like it's truth. And when you think about Hollywood, you can watch a movie, and you can be so enraptured in that movie, and it's not even true, you know, it, whether it's danger, whether it's help for somebody, whether it's a love story, and you're sitting there crying, and the story's not even true. You know? And they have all kinds of movies out about the apocalypse and all of these things, and people are afraid to watch them. But it's Hollywood, you know? But we have the Bible. Amen? We have the Word of God. And we need to not preach it or share it like it's fiction, but we need to preach it and share it like it is the truth. Amen? And then our hearts and our souls will be into the message that we have in the Scripture. Look again at Psalm 90, and we'll start in verse 10. The days of our years are threescore and ten. That's threescore, which is sixty, and ten, which is seventy. And if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, eighty, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is cut off, and we fly away. There's an old, old-time hymn, I'll fly away, O glory. Verse 11, who knoweth the power of thine anger, even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. So teach us to number our days, 
that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? And let it repent thee concerning thy servants. O satisfy us early with thy mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us and the years wherein we have seen evil. Let thy works appear unto thy servants and thy glory unto their children. And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us and establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands establish thou it. Teach us to number our days. Amen. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, God help us in this service. May your spirit uh, just have, have his way in every heart, in every mind. I pray that the, the words would be alive and living and powerful. I pray that they would be life-changing. And many of us have been Christians for years. We know a lot of Bible. But we pray, like the psalmist said, anoint me with fresh oil. I pray, God, you would enlighten us and open our hearts to these truths. In Jesus' name we pray. Help us. Amen. It's a great psalm, and it has great truth. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 1, the Bible says, Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth. Here's a young man. Remember God. You know, start your life out right. But you come to the psalm, Psalm 92, 14. We are to have fruit in old age. And that's the fruit of the Spirit, but it's also he that winneth souls is wise, the fruit of, of the soul winning part of that. In Psalm 71, uh, if you want to turn back there, you may. It's right around the corner. And Psalm 71, let me find the verse, verse 9. Cast me not off in the time of old age. Forsake me not when my strength faileth. I have that underlined, circled, in two different colors in a well-worn page of my Bible. <laughs> so you pray those prayers. You come down to verse oh, 16. I will go in the strength of the Lord God. I will make mention of thy righteousness, even of thine only. I go in his strength. So we pray for his strength. There's a number of verses that tell us to do that. Verse 18. Now also when I am old and gray-headed, I have, th I have three of these at home. Just when one gets messed up, you just pop another one on. When I am old, and by the way, gray-headed, I have some friends that are, were very young when they got gray, you know, so that isn't always true. Anyway, back to the scripture. Now also, and I am old and gray-headed, O God, forsake me not, forsake me not, until I have showed thy strength unto this generation and thy power to everyone that is to come. And, you know, what a prayer that is, because God doesn't forsake us. He will never leave us nor forsake us. You go to Psalm 73. It's the same type of principle in verse 23, if you want to look at it. Nevertheless, David is talking about how foolish he was in envying certain people because he knows their end, but he knows his end. And so it takes away that envy and that regret uh, because he's happy about what the Lord's done for him. He says in verse 23, Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by my right hand. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. So there is an afterward. Amen? This isn't all there is to it, and I think that's an important thing. Um, I was thinking of the lady that I mentioned in announcements and how she has passed and now that she is with the Lord and how her life was a wonderful story and a wonderful testimony. I think 93 years old. Um, I've been preaching for a number of years, and I've preached this text before about, um, let me get there, uh, Psalm 90. That's in the Bible over this way, okay. One more page. I lied. One more page. It says... The days of our years are three score and ten. If by reason of strength, they'd be four score years. So 70 years old. I remember making some notes when I was 56 and I preached this message. I remember preaching it in Sturgis. And I said, if that verse is true, 70 years, I've got 14 more years. 
Am I correct in that 70 minus 56, uh, carry the seven and add the two and, okay, 14 years. And well, those 14 years went quick. And here I am, 70 years old. I know I don't look 70, and I'm very humble. But uh, I mean, you get, you, get, you get older and you get older quick, you know? And you, man, how long have I been out of school? You know, and I remember going to kindergarten. I mean, the time just, it just passes. And so we don't know if we're going to make it to 70, and we don't know how long we're going to make it after 70. But God does. And the point of the message today is what comes after that. And uh, that's a wonderful thing to talk about. In 2 Samuel chapter 19, verse 35, there was a man by Barzillai, and he David is now, Absalom is dead. David is now going into Jerusalem. He's going to be the king. And Barzillai was a real friend to him. But Barzillai was 80 years old. And back in that day, he was kind of worn out. Listen to what he says to David. I was a good friend to David. 2 Samuel 19.35, he said, I am this day fourscore years old, and can I discern between good and evil? <laughs> Sometimes our reasoning isn't right up there now there's an exception in our church there really is because it doesn't matter how old anybody here is they're just sharp as a tack did I cover that pretty good that's that's a politically correct statement to make um, what are we doing here today <laughs> neither am I Richard he goes on to say can thy servant taste what I eat or what I drink? The point of this is he's 80 years old, and because he's 80 years old, some of his senses aren't working the way they used to. Can I hear any more the voice of singing men and singing women? Wherefore then should thy servant be yet a burden unto my Lord the King? He says, I'm a physical burden, and I don't want to be that burden to you. And, uh, but we see the point there. But the point that I'm going to bring out today is not our past, not our, even our present, but our future. It says in our text in Psalm 90, we fly away. And then Psalm 73, afterward. So there is a great, great, great day coming. Uh, Spurgeon wrote this. He said, it is soon cut off, quoting Psalm 90, and we fly away. The cable is broken and the vessel sails upon the sea of eternity. The chain is snapped and the eagle mounts to its native air above the clouds. It is soon cut off. We're like a, a caged bird. And one day that cage is going to be open and we're going to fly away. That's how the Bible describes that. In James chapter 4 and verse 14, Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even as a vapor, a vapor that appeareth for a little while, a little time, and then vanisheth away. First Chronicles 29, 15. It says, For we are strangers before thee, and sojourners, as were all our fathers. Our days on the earth are as a shadow, and there is none abiding. One more, Job 14, 1. Man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. History, Durrell said, is an endless repetition of the wrong way of living. What a statement to make. And somebody else said, one thing we learn from history is that we don't learn anything from history. And so it's like a spiral, you know. And uh, what is the second law of thermodynamics? You say, you know all that stuff? No, I read this illustration in a book. Uh, the second law, everything is wearing out. Everything's wearing out. It's not getting more vibrant. It's wearing out. And that's just the way it is. Our days upon the earth are full of trouble. So I want to look at today what it means to fly away and have the focus of our, our minds on that. Bushnell wrote, every man's life is a plan of God. The psalmist said, my times are in his hands. That's God's hands. So he doeth all things well. And we just look to the Lord, whether we're 20, 40, 80, older. And, you know, just because we're getting older, there are young people that that the Lord takes home. So, but God has a plan for every life, amen? And every life outside of the rapture happening, every life is going to taste death. 
But he tasted death for every man, but because of him, we're all going to have life, eternal life, which beats this hands down. Exodus 19 and verse 4. Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bury you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Here's the picture. That's not an eternal thing. That's a present thing. I bear you on eagles' wings. Deuteronomy 32, 11. As an eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttereth over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them, beareth them on her wings. So the Lord alone did lead him. If you know that about eagles, uh, they've got to get that, that eaglet. Is it eaglet? Man. Boy, that's impressive, isn't that? The, the eaglet, and they've got to get them out of the nest. But they're timid and they're shy, so sometimes that eagle will push them out of the nest. But he'll always swoop down and catch them before they hit the ground on eagle's wings. Amen? Sometimes we need to get out of our comfort zone, out of our nest. But the Lord's always there. Malachi 4.2. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. I think it was Morrow, and he said, Earth hath no sorrow that heaven cannot heal. And God makes some promises to us. So heaven is the believer's eternal home. This is the nasty now and now. That's the sweet by and by, right? We are in the nasty now and now. Uh, and one day we're going to be in heaven. That's a promise. You have in Job 14, 5. Seeing his days are determined... The number of his months are with thee. Thou hast appointed his bounds that he cannot pass. So teach us to number our days, because our days are determined. Psalm 90 and verse 12, that's what it says there. Uh, seventy years, if you live until you're 70, or if you have lived until you're 70, you either you have used all these days up, and now you're on some future days. But if you haven't reached 70 yet, 70 years you're going to live 25,550 days. If you live to 70 years old, you live 25,570 days. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 2, the Bible says it's a time to be born and a time to die. So you start counting the days. Here's your birthday, right? And you celebrate it every year until there's a time you don't want to celebrate it anymore. Some people are like that. But you start counting the days. So teach us to number our days. If you're 30, you've used up 10,950 days. Get, but you get 25,550 days. If you're 40, you've used up 14,600 days. If you're 50, you've used up 18,250 days. If you're 60, you've used up 21,900 days. And you have 3,650 days left. But if you're older than that, you see, these days are shrinking as these days are getting larger. We don't know if it's going to be 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100. We don't know that. But those are the days we have. So teach us to number our days. Sometimes people... When they're younger, well, I'll just wait because I have all this time. But see, we don't know that day. There's a time to be born and a time to die, and it's not the same for everybody. Second Corinthians 6, 2. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Genesis chapter 27 and verse 2. And he said, Behold, now I am old. I know not the day of my death. I know not the day of my death. Here's the day of my salvation. Here's the day of my death. Ecclesiastes 7 1. A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than one the day of one's birth. It's a better day than the day of our birth. And we've got, to, got that switched around. Because we don't want to die. That's because of the physical part of us and the emotional attachments that we have. Amen. But it's a better day than the day of one's birth. That's what it's saying, because that's going to be heaven. Amen. That's going to be quite a day. Um, Jeremy Taylor wrote, God has given to a man a short time here upon earth, and yet upon this short time, eternity depends. Turn over to the book of Luke. I want to read a story there. The book of Luke, Luke chapter 12. 
And we'll read a few verses there. Luke chapter 12. People, when somebody passes, sometimes people argue about who left or what was left to them and what was left to another and this is unfair and that's fair. Uh, sometimes there can be a lot of strife in that. And so this is the story in verse 15, Luke 12. And he said unto them, Take heed and beware, I'm sorry, 13, verse 13. And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge and divider over you? There are th some things the Lord just has no interest in. Amen. And verse 15, And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. There was plenty, plenty. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods. Watch the, watch the phrase here. Laid up for many years. That's taking care of the future, right? That is what we call in America retirement. And you try and do the best you can. But this, he had an excessive amount. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said, so he said, this is what I'm going to do. And God said something else. God said, unto him, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee, then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. I was looking at that again this morning, and I decided to read a couple verses out of Ecclesiastes to go along with that. Ecclesiastes, okay, here's Solomon, and I mean, he has everything, right? He has all power, all wealth, he has everything. It, in chapter 2, it goes over that. Let me just bring out a couple phrases. I made me great works. That's verse 4. Verse 7, I had great possessions. Verse 9, so I was great. And he goes on and on and on. And he finally comes down to verse 17. Therefore, I hated life. <laughs> he, had, he had everything that he could have. Therefore, I hated life because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me for all is vanity and vexation of spirit. Yea, I hated all my labor which I have taken under the sun because I should leave it unto the man that shall be after me. I've worked and I've got to leave it to somebody else. And sometimes we're insurance poor. You know what I mean? We're poor because we pay for so much insurance. But when we're gone, somebody else is going to benefit from that. Amen. little side thing there. But uh, anyway, we get back to the book of Luke and we read this story and we think about this. And the f whole focus in Ecclesiastes was that too because the key phrase in the book of Ecclesiastes is under the sun. Okay, it's all the, the perspective from down here. But here's a man, he had more than heart could wish. And what did he do with it? In Isaiah 56 and verse 12, Come ye, say they, I will fetch wine, and we will fill ourselves with strong drink. And tomorrow shall be as this day, and much more abundant. Really? Will it really be that way? I mean, we're all planning, right? We're planning for so many things. James 4, 13 and 14. Go to now, ye that say tomorrow, today or tomorrow, we will go into such city, and continue there a year, and buy and sell and get gain, whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little while, and then vanisheth away. No, we're going to do this for a year. You don't know if you're going to do that for a year. Well, that's a plan, and you've got to make plans, but you don't know what God's going to do with those plans. The days of our years. Leviticus 14, 2. And there's so many verses like this and so many applications. This shall be the law of the leper in the day of his cleansing. Okay, you go back to Leviticus and you find the law of the leper. This is what the leper needs to do on the day of his cleansing. That was a big day for him. You have Numbers 10.10, 10, also in the day of your gladness. 1 Samuel 13.22, in the day of battle. Psalm 20 and verse 1, in the day of trouble. Ecclesiastes 7.14, in the day of prosperity. Be joyful, but in the day of adversity, consider. 
God also has set the one over against the other. So they both have a purpose. So here's a day this is happening. What is God saying to me? What is God speaking to me about? This is another day. What is this? What is God trying to do in my life now or somebody else's life? We spend our years as a tale that is told. So if you look backward and in your own mind, uh, just look backward at your life. Uh, remember your childhood, something from your childhood. Maybe uh, remember your first time in church. Maybe you weren't going as a child and your parents didn't go. Uh, remember the day you got saved. Remember this day. Remember that day. There are big days. Remember your wedding day. Remember this day. You know, remember the day that a dear friend died, but you knew they were with the Lord. I mean, there's all kinds. There's heartache. There's joy. You know, there's fear. There's regret, right? And that's, that's our past. But what about our future? What is that going to be like? We know the day of our salvation. We don't know the day the Lord's going to come for us, or we don't know the day the Lord's going to take us home. Amen? But we know what's going to happen after that, and that's a blessing. In Ecclesiastes 8.8, 8, There is no man that hath power over the Spirit to retain the Spirit, neither hath he power in the day of death, and there is no discharge in that war. He doesn't have any power. Um, and, is it and as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So it, there's an appointment, amen? And we don't presume upon God, well, God knows when I'm going to die, so I'm just going to jump off the Empire State Building. Well, I guess that's the day. <laughs> You know what I mean? And, uh, but you, you don't presume upon anything and live recklessly. But, I mean, there's a day out there. Amen? God knows from eternity past all the way through eternity future. He's the Alpha, the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. So he knows. He knows everything. He knew if you were going to accept him as your Savior. He knew that foreknowledge. He didn't make you, but he knew it. Amen? So he knows when our day is so let us teach us to number our days our days every day something can be done for the lord maybe he's just praying for somebody but every day is an important day ephesians 4 30 the day of redemption only one life will soon be passed only what's done for christ will last only one life will soon be passed in our text there's 70 years and there's 80 years. But go back to Genesis chapter 5. And we'll start the message. Boy, I miss Lee. Genesis chapter 5. You read Genesis chapter 5. And he died 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 and he died. I'm not exaggerating. And he died and he died and he died. I mean, if you read that chapter, that's what you'll find. Verse 5. All the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. That's a long life, man, 930 years. Can you imagine how good you'd be on the piano? Probably, you'd probably be as good as Judy if you took lessons for 930 years. Verse 8, and all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. Long life, but he died. Everybody's going to die. And all the days of Enoch were 905 years, and he died, verse 11. Uh, verse 14, all the days of Canaan were 910 years, and he died. All the days of Mahaliel were 890 and five years. He died early, 895 years. He didn't live till 900. That's a joke. See, 895 years. Um, you have Methuselah. He was the longest one. He, he lived... Uh, 969 years and he died so they all died that's before the flood that's Genesis chapter 5 you get into chapter 6 and chapter 7 and on and you start talking about Noah and you start talking about the flood so I want to look in chapter 11 I remember they build the tower of Babel because they were going to make them a tower all the way up to heaven so if another flood came, if the judgment of God came again, we'll outsmart God. Uh, nobody outsmarts God. 
But anyway, we come to chapter 11. And if you, if you would read beginning in verse oh, 10 through the end of the chapter, you're going to see another genealogy. But they're not 969 years and 920 years. They're getting shorter. This is after the flood. Well, how come after the flood? Well, it was the atmosphere. Well, it was this. Whatever the reason was, after the flood, they didn't have that long of a lifespan. Uh, for example, when you get to, just to save time, uh, you get to the end of chapter 11, and Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his son's sons, and Sarah, the daughter-in-law, and his son, uh, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth, etc., etc. Verse 32, and the days of Terah were 205 years. That's still a long time. And that's the consensus of that chapter. You, you're all the way down to 205 years from 900 years. That's a pretty big swing. Amen? 700 years. But it's still a long time to live. We come to Psalm 90, and now it's 70 years. But if by reason of strength it be fourscore years, there, yet there's labor and sorrow in that, but 80, we say, oh, that's, that's a pretty good old age. Amen? 90. That, well, that's, you look good for 90. You're still doing real well for 90. Oh, 95, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Gino, you know, 87. Look, look at him. I mean, you would never know he's 87. But, uh, I mean, as, so we get older, right? But we're not living to 200. Every once in a while, you'll read in the newspaper about somebody, the centurion. No, it's not a centurion. Is that what it's called? That's a Roman soldier. It's still the same thing? Oh, that's because he had 100 men under him. Right, okay. So here's, here's a, a person that's 100 years old, and they're saying, man, look at them. They're still getting around. They're still driving a golf cart, <laughs> you know, but, but they're getting around 100 years. Why did that happen? Well, there's an answer for that. Um, let me see if I can find the verse. Chapter Genesis 6 and verse 5. And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's before the flood. Here people are living to 900 years. And God sent the flood, right? Why did he send the flood? Because man's heart was set on evil and his mind continually, uh, all his imaginations were of evil. And I want you to get this thought. Jonathan Edwards wrote this. It's a paragraph, so try and concentrate on it. Man's life being cut so very short tended to prepare the way for poor, short-lived men the more joyfully to entertain the glad tidings of everlasting life, brought to light by the gospel and more readily to embrace a Savior that purchases and offers such a blessing. If men's lives were still commonly about 900 years, how much less would be the inducement to regard the blessings of a future life? How much greater the temptation to rest in the things of this world? and to neglect any other life but this. This probably contributed greatly to the wickedness of those people that lived before the flood. But now how much greater motives have men to seek redemption and a better life than this by the great Redeemer, since the life of man is not one-twelfth part of what it used to be, and men now universally die at the age when formerly they used to be setting out in the world. There are so many verses in the Bible and so many ways to go with that principle and that truth that is true. Because judgment is brought, not brought speedily, man's heart is set to do evil. And that's in, that's in the Scripture. And what happens is all this time, well, I've got all this time. You know, I'm, I'm only 150, you know, and i got 900 years. And, and just that, that imagination just... All it did was turn to evil. As, as in the days of Noah, as in the days of Lot, you know, and you go back and you see how that mind 
that's not serving the Lord. Oh, there was Noah. Oh, there was Noah. Oh, who else was there? Well, there was Noah, right? I mean, and it got like that. It was a terrible, terrible thing in the earth. And so God sent a flood. By the way, he promised not to send another one. In Ecclesiastes, it's better to go to the house of mourning than the house of feasting. For this is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. It's better to go to the house of mourning. It's better to think about our end and then what God is going to do for us. Amen? So teach us to number our days. And for the Christian, that is a real blessing. God, this is the statement of the message. God is wise and merciful to reveal to mankind his brevity of life. God is wise and kind to reveal to us our brevity of life. Our life is like a vapor. It's here today. It's gone tomorrow. Our days are few and full of trouble. Oh, we enjoy the Lord and we enjoy some things, but it's a battle, is it not? We fight the flesh. We fight the world. We fight the wickedness in the world. And it seems like the wickedness is growing. And that's Bible. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And so we see this in the news, and we hear about this, and we read about this, and we go, oh, my, what's the answer? <laughs> the Lord coming. Amen? Our eternal life. So teach us to number our days. Luke 12, 19, I will say to my soul, soul, take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. I have much goods laid up for many years. What was his concept? He had all this time. I'm putting all my eggs in this basket. I'm doing this. But God said, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Uh, there's a verse. What am I thinking of, Richard? Okay. Uh, yeah, the Bible says in Malachi 6, I just woke up. That's exactly the verse I wanted. Man, that's a good verse. But... Uh, what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? You know, I read or listen sometimes about these, these business people. They're not only billionaires, they're almost trillionaires, you know. I mean, what would you do with $50 billion? I mean, but really, I mean, what would you... You could spend... So much money every day, and you'd never run out of money. You'd probably give a billion to me, wouldn't you? Amen? Make that commitment in case you come into some money. But So he says to this man, and, and we see that principle in the Bible. Listen, we're just passing through. Amen? We're just passing through. And our days are few, so teach us to number our days. I mentioned earlier the thief on the cross. And uh, he said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said, today. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. If there was ever a life story that was transformed at the last minute, it was that. And I heard a preacher say one time, there's only one story in the Bible that talks about that deathbed salvation. Uh, so we went and presume upon God, but there is one so we don't lose hope. Amen? No matter what the story of your life, and it's being written, I mean it's being written, you'll be remembered long after you're gone and their works do follow them, for good or for evil. But, praise the Lord, the day is coming where we're going to be with the Lord and that's the end of the story. Amen? Let's bow our heads, please. Father, thank you for the promises that we have. Thank you for the brevity of our life. We could read Genesis 5 and say, man, I wish I could have lived that long, but you know you're an all-wise God. Thank you for the brevity of life. Thank you for the eternity of everlasting life. And may our hearts and our minds be there. Teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand, please.